In this video, I want to explore a game from my childhood. Now that I'm older and have more experience with computers, I can have a very different perspective on it. So I want to look at Pokemon Red. As a child, I was obsessed with this game and I loved exploring it. And of course, the glitches or cheats were fascinating. And I might now be able to understand how they actually work. And for this, I'm teaming up with my friend over at the YouTube channel Stack Smashing, or formerly known as Geedra Ninja, he had to change his name. Excellent hacking channel, go subscribe. Anyway, in this video, I wanted to start by exploring the safe game of Pokemon Red and see if we can hack some stuff. The cool thing about a console as old as the Game Boy is, you have very advanced emulators which you can use to look into the memory of games, even debug them. I'm using the emulator Same Boy for this. So here I have my personal backup ROM of Pokemon Red, which we can open in the emulator. Of course I own a physical copy of the game, I do not condone piracy. Anyway, here's the game running in the emulator. Oh, my nostalgia is kicking in. This emulator has developer features where you can open a memory view and it displays here the whole memory area. But this entire memory is split up into multiple areas and they are shown here in the drop down menu. You have the ROM, so this is the code of the game stored on the cartridge. You have video RAM, the memory to drive the display. Very important obviously, your graphics card in your computer also has a VRAM. And of course, the regular CPU of the Game Boy also uses normal RAM, used during the execution of the game. But what is the cartridge RAM? Obviously, I also don't know all this stuff, so I have done a bit of research, and there's this excellent website, Game Boy Dev, documenting everything you could imagine about the Game Boy system. And even the Pokemon Wiki, Bulbapedia, has a lot of technical resources about the games as well. So most of the stuff I'm telling you now, I know from there. Anyway, you might know that Game Boy cartridges contain a battery, or most of them contain a battery. There, there are a few games that don't have it. And you might know that the battery is connected to your save data. When the battery runs out, you lose your save game. A lot of people have cried the past few years because now we reach the end of life of these batteries they were holding for like 15 years. And the game is obviously older. Nowadays, we are very spoiled with flash memory that can just store data without electricity. But back then, I guess this was too expensive. Anyway, if you want to store save game data or anything like settings or high scores, you need to include this as a feature in your cartridge. And the Game Boy architecture planned for this and dedicated a memory area of the memory map to external RAM. So the cartridges, like the Pokemon games, included RAM. Because RAM is volatile and loses the data without being powered, it had to include a battery. So basically the cartridge was never actually turned off. The memory map maps the external RAM from address A000 to BFFF. So only hex 2000 bytes, that's 8 kilobytes of RAM. However, for example for the Pokemon games, you had to store tons of data about the game. Think about it, you need to store which Pokemon you have seen and caught, each Pokemon might have a nickname and your own set of stats, level and attacks, which trainers you fought against, so much stuff. And it doesn't fit into only 8 kilobytes. So the memory bank controller of the Game Boy supports memory banks. You can imagine banks as simple boxes. Addresses are used to access whatever is in the current box in front of you. Let's say at address A010 is something stored. And now you can ask the memory bank controller to switch to a different box. And then the same addresses, A010, would now return whatever is stored in this new box. And so here in the memory view, when selecting the cartridge RAM, you can switch between the different banks. Bank 0, Bank 1, Bank 2, and Bank 3. And it looks like at the start of the game only Bank 0 contains some data. Now, this is how we can look at the memory with the emulator. But how does the game itself switch between which bank it wants to access? In the Game Boy Dev Wiki, we can learn how this works. Memory addresses from hex 400 to 5FF addresses the RAM bank number. You can write to it. You can write two bits to this, and this two-bit register can be used to select a RAM bank in the range from 0 to 3. And I find this so fascinating, because this memory area is actually part of the ROM. The game code is at this address area, so how does this make sense? 
Well, ROM is read-only memory. The game code cannot be modified, it's burned into the ROM, so it never makes sense to write to it. It wouldn't work. Only reading from it makes sense because the CPU reads the instructions from there or any other kind of data like sprites. So why not reuse the same addresses area for some hardware configuration stuff? Basically, the memory controller is built in a way that when a write is attempted to this specific area from hex 400 to 5FF, it actually controls which memory bank is currently selected. Very clever, right? Anyway, let's get back to the game. Now we know this cartridge memory should contain the save game data. So let's start a new game and click through the starting conversation until we enter our name. Here let's use some easily recognizable characters, like in exploit development, just a bunch of A's. Continue and give the rival also a name. I use a couple of A's and then BCD. Alright. When you look into the folder of your game ROM, you might notice a .sav file. I specifically trigger a write of this by saving the state. This also creates a S1 file. But it's unimportant, I only want to have this .sav file. Let's open the save file in a hex editor. I'm using hexfiend here and then also open up the cartridge RAM memory. As you can see, when you carefully compare the content, they are the same. So this SAF file is actually a dump of the cartridge RAM, basically storing the RAM over a longer time, like the battery in the cartridge would. So when we work with the save game data, we can simply work with the SAF file. Cool. I actually create a copy of this RAM dump now and name it AAA to indicate this was the save game with the player name AA. Now let's close the game, delete the save game and restart. Now start a new game and I name the player BBBBB and I name my rival BBBCDE. We go into the game again and save the game. Trigger a state save and copy the new save file as BBBBB save. So now we have two save games from right at the start of the game with only the names of me and my rival being different. Let's open both files in hexfiend and then compare them. This puts them side by side and we can easily find the differences. And here's the first one. Look closely, we have here seven bytes that are different. The player name was seven characters long and all of them were the same, AAA. And all of those bytes are the same. And coincidentally, the bytes for BBB are hex81, so exactly plus one from the AAA bytes. Could this be our player name? I mean, it's not ASCII, a capital A in ASCII would be hex for one, but maybe this game uses a different encoding for characters. So if we assume that hex80 is an A and hex A1 is a B and the name is seven characters long, we should also be able to find the rival's name. And it looks like this change here could be it. In both cases, we started with the same characters, AA or BB, and then increment up the characters, seven characters long. So yeah, this should be the rival's name. Some other data in there also changed, but no clue what that is. And the last difference is this one single byte at the end of the area, just before the FFs start. So how about we do a small test? We could try to change our name. Let's open the real SAF file in hexfiend and convert all the Bs, which were hex81 into Cs, so hex82s. Let's save it and then start the game again. Did it work? Uh huh. Oh man, the file data is destroyed. Somehow our change didn't work. Well, obviously, people have figured out all the details already. It turns out that there is a checksum to make sure the data is not corrupted. This is nicely described on the Bulbapedia article about the safe data structure. Used to validate the integrity of safe data. The checksum in generation one is only eight bits and has a single copy of it. Guess which 8 bits? So which byte could be the checksum? It's of course this byte all the way at the end. If this value is incorrect, the error message, the file data is destroyed, will appear. Now, even if you did not know the actual checksum algorithm, you only have 256 options. So if you are really dedicated, you could just try different values until the file is valid. But let's see how the checksum calculation works. The algorithm used to calculate the checksum is as follows. Initialize the checksum to 255, so hex FF, and then for every byte from hex 2598 to 3522 inclusive, subtract its value from the checksum. So let's actually implement this in Python, a fixed checksum py script. 
First I open the file passed in via the arguments for reading and writing in binary mode. Then I read the whole content into a byte array. We initialize the checksum with hex ff and then loop over each byte from 2598 to 3522. And we subtract the current byte value from the checksum. In the end we write the checksum to address 3523. This is where the checksum is located. Now we need to write the changes to the file. So we seek back to the start of it and write the new fixed RAM in the byte array back to the file. Let's execute it and pass in the self file. Awesome, that should have worked. Let's open up the emulator again and see what happens. Ah, no error and we can continue our saved game. And look at that, our name is CCCC now. It worked. Of course, you could now use similar diffing strategies to for example find the player coordinates or level of Pokemons or the items you hold and so forth. Always save the game, do an action, save again and compare the two. It's fun and can be used to somewhat reverse engineer the save game structure. Of course, people have already done that and it's all documented on Bulbapedia. And so here we could have also learned that the player name is at this offset and the rival name is at this offset. Also I noticed that when you have the cartridge view open while playing the game, the RAM is not always visible. Sometimes it's gone. And at first I thought it's a bug, but then I asked Stack Smashing and he figured out how the Game Boy Dev documents that the external RAM can be enabled and disabled. Writing to this memory area, a zero or hex A will disable or enable the RAM. You can kind of see that when saving the game. As soon as you hit yes, you see briefly the RAM memory being enabled and then quickly after writing the save game getting disabled again. I also noticed that when you open the player profile it will enable the RAM and keep it enabled. So that's very convenient. Also in the debugger of the emulator you can type in CA for cartridge to get some info. And you can see for example that this particular game cartridge includes battery backed RAM of the size 8000 bytes and RAM is currently disabled. But when you open the profile and check again, now the RAM is enabled. Cool. It's so much fun to play around with it. You should try if you can make your own Pokemon level higher or make yourself rich. As I said, I'm collaborating here with Stack Smashing, so check out his recent video about the Game Boy copy protection and how he tricked the Game Boy using an FPGA. Very cool video.